So, as other people have mentioned, the dual use dilemma is essentially the problem that arises in most fields of science, if not all, whereby scientific development, a piece of technology, is has got good uses, uh, is for the benefit of humanity, uh, but at the same time, it, it's problematic if uh, it gets into the hands of malevolent agents. So, classic examples would be in the nuclear industry, where on the one hand, nuclear power for peaceful purposes is very useful, but on the other hand, uh, building nuclear weapons are highly problematic. Uh, as other people have mentioned, there are the possibility of so-called malevolent agents, individuals or groups, uh, terrorists, rogue states, even uh, nation states, um, that otherwise might not be regarded as, as rogue states. Uh, nihilistic groups, end of the world groups, we want to, we think the world is coming to an end and we want to hasten its end. Um, these sorts of groups, criminals who are seeking to blackmail, there are various um, candidates for uh, dual use, misuse. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples um, of, of dual use in the biological sciences. One of them was mentioned earlier by Julie, I'll come to that in a minute, but these examples are interesting. In one sense, I'm in Australia. This was this example is from Australia, the mousepox uh, scenario. This involved uh, work by Australian biological scientists who were intending to develop a genetically engineered sterility treatment to combat uh, mice plague in Australia. So that's a good a good thing to do. Um, that's the good part of the equation. Unfortunately. Um, there was a problem in that they it led to the creation of a highly virulent strain of mousepox, uh, and the possibility, uh, as a consequence, of developing a highly virulent strain of smallpox, which would be able to overcome available vaccines. And of course, if that were to get into the hands of terrorists, then that would be highly problematic. Hence the uh, the misuse. So on the one hand, there was the option to go ahead with research with all the good benefits. On the other hand, another option, don't do it because of the possible downsides. Um, again, with the ferret flu case that happened here in, um, here in uh, Holland, and we held a workshop on this earlier this year, uh, research on a deadly flu virus, H5N1, which causes bird flu. Scientists here developed a highly transmissible form of this virus. As it turned out, uh, it was non-lethal, though there was a lot of uh, argumentation around this to, and unclarity about this to start off with. Uh, the media certainly was under the impression, and a lot of scientists were under the impression that it was both highly transmissible and lethal, but it turned out to be non-lethal. The work was done on ferrets, uh, and the relevance of that is that they're a very good model for predicting the likely effects on humans. Once again, two options. Go ahead with the, the research go ahead with the research because uh, this will enable advanced warning of emerging contagious strains or it may lead to facil facilitation of the development of vaccines against similarly naturally occurring uh, created strains. Good reasons to go ahead with the research apparently, although that's been disputed by some scientists. Option two, don't go ahead with the research uh, since it might eventually lead to the creation of a virus which is both highly virulent and easily transmissible to humans. Too dangerous. They got, on the one hand, option, let's do this because it could lead to benefits. On the other hand, uh, the potential for to wreak havoc is too great, uh, particularly if it gets into the hands of the wrong people. Okay, so that's the kind of dual use problem in a nutshell. Um, it's important, I think, to distinguish here between uh, the primary user, the actual researcher that's going ahead doing the research, the primary user, the, the primary user, the primary researcher is intending to do good, is intending to bring benefits to human time. However, there's a secondary user, or potentially a secondary user, for example, a terrorist or some member of a, a nihilistic uh, religious group or whatever, that intends to do great harm. So on the one hand, you've got the primary user, on the other hand, you've got the secondary user. Um, and this distinction enables, to, and this uh, distinction enables us to set aside accidents as somewhat different from uh, dual use issues which involve a malevolent agent that wants to seek to do harm, whereas accidents uh, don't necessarily involve that. Um, on the other hand, um, 
as uh, I think Ken pointed out, uh, the, the lines between these uh, areas, between intentional misuses, dual use, and accidents, no malevolent uh, misuser, are somewhat blurred when one considers that accidents can occur as a result of, uh, say, criminal negligence. And that blurs the distinction between someone who's intentionally doing harm and someone who has, in effect, uh, caused harm or failed to prevent harm through uh, negligence, gross negligence, as opposed to some accident that no one could possibly have uh, predicted. Okay, the next point I think that needs to be made is that the dual use dilemma is essentially an ethical dilemma. The options that are available uh, have to be selected in part on the basis of ethical or moral considerations, and, and in particular, harm, loss of life, health, and so on, uh, are, are very much part of the costs and benefits that, that are equated uh, in terms of the options. A second respect in which this is an ethical dilemma is that there's an important principle uh, that we normally uh, comply with, an important moral or ethical principle, which is not to, not to harm other people. You drive down the street in the car, you, you break when someone goes across the uh, in front of you because you're not supposed to harm people. Well, there's a there's a version of this principle which is relevant to the dual use issue, um, and it's not quite the don't harm principle. It's slightly different, and it's the principle that you should not intentionally provide others with the means to do harm. You should not intentionally provide others with the means to do harm. So, for example, you shouldn't sell guns to uh, dangerous people. Uh, of course, you're not the one that's going to shoot uh, the people. You're not going to use the gun. You're not intending to directly harm anyone. If you sell a gun to someone who uh, you know or could reasonably think might do people harm with it, then you have provided someone else with the means to do harm. And so the key issue here for scientists is sitting down, doing their scientific work, don't intend to harm anyone, but they've still got to comply with this additional uh, principle, which is don't provide others with the means to do harm. And if you know that uh, you're doing something that could potentially be used by others to do harm, and if you know those others are out there and will will, will use that uh, that means, then obviously that's problematic, and you breach that principle. Now, like most moral principles, the principle of don't providing of not providing others with the means to do harm is not an absolute principle. It's a principle that has to be stacked up against other moral considerations in particular contexts. Um, and so, for example, we provide police with guns, and the reason we do that is, uh, well, obviously there's an intention that they may harm people, but the, but, the, but the point is that they may need to harm people to prevent uh, greater harm being done by those people. Okay, um, and here I think it's important to see that making the, choosing between these options and choosing which principles in a particular context should override which other principles is very much a matter of judgment. It's a matter of judgment about likely outcomes, what is actually likely to happen if I go into this research, what is likely to happen if I don't. It's also a matter of weighing, as it were, the moral, the moral costs and the moral benefits uh, in relation to those outcomes. Uh, and this is a tricky business and it involves uh, judgment. Okay, now the dual use problem um, in, in various areas of science and technology, not just in the biological sciences, but in nanotech, nanotechnology, nuclear, uh, nuclear sciences, and so on, uh, arises in different spheres of science and technology, but it arises for different people. It's not just a dilemma for the, for the researchers. It's not just a dilemma for the people who are doing uh, the scientific or technological work. It's a dilemma for the governments, it's a dilemma for the community, it's a, it's a dilemma for the, for the universities that may be funding or providing the, uh, the institutional uh, background for this work to go ahead. It may be a private sector organization. They are also part of the mix when it comes to dual use um, dilemma. So there are many different levels for whom it's a dilemma. Ultimately, it's a dilemma for the government because they have the responsibility uh, to reduce risks from biosecurity and other risks. And of course, for the community, since they are the ones that are going to be affected uh, in the various ways. They're going, to be, they're going to benefit from the research possibly, but they're also going to be the recipients of the harm 
uh, very likely if things go wrong. So it's a dilemma for them in a democracy. They have to ultimately uh, run with the thought and make these decisions. In an increasingly uh, interdependent, as we're told on a daily basis, set of nation states, the so-called global community, the dual use uh, dilemma has become a dilemma for the international body such as the United Nations. So it's not simply a dilemma, for example, as um, Andrea was, was pointing out very very correctly, it's a, it's a problem within the context of the European uh, Union, but it's also uh, a global problem because, of course, science, as it were, knows no boundaries. This The work in the biological sciences, the work in, in uh, technology and so on, isn't, it doesn't stop at the European border or the, or the Netherlands border. So these issues transcend borders and therefore become uh, a dilemma for the international community and therefore for international bodies uh, such as the United Nations, the WHO and so on. And finally, I note that the dilemma is perhaps most acute in those areas of science technology that operate around, as it were, an engineering uh, model, sort of making things model as, a, as opposed to a kind of des describing things model, particularly in areas like synthetic synthetic biology, nanotechnology, and so on. Okay, um, so let me now turn to some of the uh, institutional arrangements that are in place uh, not to deal with uh, the dual use dilemma. I'll come back to that uh, shortly uh, and follow up some of the things that were suggested by Julia and Andrea. Um, what I want to talk about is the current institutional arrangements and how they may facilitate or exacerbate uh, or, or be preventative with respect to the dual use issue. So let's think of three uh, different sectors. First sector is of course commercial firms. Commercial firms, so biotech firms, are engaged in market-based competition. Uh, and so there's, a, there's a, 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 a set of regulations which are enforced. Uh, as they conduct their business, but they are engaged in competition, and that's important in relation to a, to a concept that I'm going to introduce shortly, uh, which is in the heading for this uh, talk, namely uh, collective action problems. But, but just get in mind the idea that you've got private sector biotech companies that are competing with one another, and of course competing to generate profit. Secondly, you've got nation states. Uh, Liberal, liberal democracies, but also authoritarian states, in some cases states that, that may be failing or uh, certainly problematic in terms of their capacity to control what happens within their borders. Um, and bear in mind that those nation states are also competing with one another in various ways. They're competing with other themselves for political and economic power. They're also to some extent competing with one another in terms of supporting their own uh, economies and therefore their own industries, including, um, say, the financing, finance industries, but also the biotech industry. But there's no or very little enforceable international law in relation to this whole area. So whereas you have uh, law at the level of the nation states, uh, in many states, with respect to biosecurity, biosafety issues, um, at, the, at the international level, we've got a very thin uh, set of enforceable uh, regulations, if any. And finally, uh, coming back to the uh, arrangements we have uh, within most countries, aside from the private sector, uh, are of course the universities where a good deal of this research uh, gets done. Um, but in the universities, uh, of course, we have scientists who are also engaged in competition, somewhat different competition, uh, to a large extent, competition for status. So. Um, the point I'm making here is that these experiments and this work is not happening in an institutional vacuum. It's happening in particular institutions, private sector institutions, universities. Uh, it's happening within the context of nation states in a global kind of community. And that has implications for biosecurity and biosafety. It's not simply, um, one shouldn't simply have the image of a lone scientist or a team of scientists conducting work in a laboratory as it were cocooned from these larger institutional processes and influences. You had a question? Yeah, could you um, give an example of a law, a national law? Um, the, the we'll say, sure, I mean there's, in most countries there'll be a whole range of laws about the transport of, of uh, pathogens, about 
to be licensing arrangements in terms of laboratories as to who can conduct those experiments and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so, uh, as um, the, the organizers uh, very reasonably uh, have posited, and as Julio was uh, mentioned in his talk, um, it looks as though this problem, being global, being private sector, being university sector, uh, to some extent arising potentially uh, f uh, from competition, uh, looks like it needs an integrated, what I call the integrated multi-level, multi-faceted response. Uh, but perhaps talking about a web of prevention is, is a simpler and, uh, and, uh, and captured way of talking about. It. But let's just run through some of the things that could be done in relation to um, biosecurity issues generally and dual use issues uh, in particular. Uh, we can have laws and regulations, for example, licensing laboratories, um, equipment DNA, DNA synthesizers you can introduce um, in relation to, for example, weapon, weaponry, the uh, oh, the weapons convention was spoken of before, but specifically uh, it would be good to have some verification procedures. Uh, you can do things like, on, at an individual level, you can have background checks on people so that they can't actually get into particular laboratories and conduct work of a certain sort. So there's a whole raft and range of different laws and regulations that you can, you can look at. Um, secondly, um, there's an important question that needs to be settled, and settled at a number of levels, as to who is to make the... Who, who is actually to determine what, what should be put in place? Who is to make the who's, who's to be the decision maker with respect to laws, regulations, uh, and so on and so forth? Now, at one level, obviously, the government makes laws, but at another level, there's, a, there's an issue uh, about who is the one to make that decision. Is it the scientists, for example? Should we have self-regulation? Is it the uh, professional associations? Is it the uh, is it just the government? They should just step in and, and put in place whatever they think ought, ought to be the case. Uh, and scientists have suggested that this is problematic in terms of issues of scientific freedom, but also problematic in terms of the case stifle scientific work. And of course, the private sector is not going to be too happy if there's heavy-handed regulation and gets in the road of uh, the work that they're doing, the profits they're making, uh, and the products that they're producing. So there's an issue about who ought to be the one to make decisions in this and related areas. Uh, another option would be a, a, a kind of some sort of independent authority, which would be a, a government-based authority, but would be separate from the government of the day and might be uh, authority set up involving sci having scientists on it, having security people on it, uh, having private sector people on it to, to make some of these decisions. Okay, aside from issues of laws and regulations in relation to laboratories and, and so on and so forth, uh, as uh, Julio and others mentioned, there's the issue of awareness raising education uh, to give people an idea of what the issues are and what should or shouldn't be done, codes of conduct, um, you can do courses, seminars and so on. All this kind of thing um, can, be, can be looked at. One can also look at uh, reputational <coughs> devices, so if particular institutions or individuals are, as it were, failing to live up to reasonable standards in relation to biosecurity, um, they can be um, targeted by way of reputational devices, um, which is something that happens in a lot of other areas where uh, individuals or firms are ranked in terms of uh, their commitment to health and safety regulations. If it's not up to, up to the mark, this can be uh, put on websites and communicated and so on. So reputational devices are another kind of way of putting pressure on individuals and groups without actually having regulations and enforcing the regulations and, and fining or locking them up or preventing them from uh, working or, or whatever. So it's a kind of software device, but it's not quite the same thing as education and training. Um, however, um, I'd suggest that there are some perverse incentive structures uh, deriving from collective action problems, which uh, I now want to kind of look at um, in relation to these issues. Um, and therefore, the regulation to some extent has to take these things into account. Let's think of another example just to kind of uh, get, us a sense, get, get a sense of what the issues might be in this area. Let's think of something in another area. So if you think about the, the, the global financial crisis, um, and, I'm, uh, and I'm not wanting to kind of uh, draw the analogy too, too much between the biological sciences and the financial crisis, but that crisis is to some extent a function of competition, let's say, between banks. Where the banks, um, each bank being competitive with the other banks, 
uh, and took perhaps what in retrospect may have been greater risks than they, they probably should have done. So on the one hand a bank borrows money and lends money, on the other hand it retains a certain amount of money as capital and, and so-called capital ratio uh, to make, as, as a kind of safety device so that it's always got a whole lot of money in its, in its offers which is not being lent to anyone um, and which then which isn't actually making any money for the bank but is a kind of safety device just in case you go to the bank and take all your money out it's still got money there to pay uh, the debts to the people um, that it's borrowed from. Okay, now the, the issue here is a kind of risk assessment issue. On the one hand we've got to make sure we've got enough money in the bank for, for problems, but on the other hand every dollar that is sitting in the vault uh, helping us be more safe and secure is a dollar that's not making another dollar. And so we had a situation where perhaps the, the risk became too great and the amount of money that was held in the vault wasn't as much as it should have been and so uh, we got ourselves uh, into the financial crisis, at least that was one of the contributing factors. Okay, so what you've got there, what have you got there? Well, what you've got is people taking excessive risk in a very competitive situation. You can understand why they took the risk because after all they're competing with all these other banks and as a result of that competition they're making profits but if they don't compete successfully they go to the wall and they go out of business. Okay, now I suggest by analogy, I suggest by analogy that that's typically what happens in competitive market situations and, and generates, as it were, different sorts of collective action problems. It's not that the individual firm is, is necessarily reckless or corrupt or, uh, or unethical. It's just that the structure of the situation tends to drive people to make decisions at the margin, to make decisions at the margin, which might, be, might not be quite the right decisions. In other words, they take just that little bit too much risk that they shouldn't have taken because of the competitive environment. Okay, and I suggest that this is potentially what could happen, say, in the private sector in relation to buy, in the biotech companies, where you've got market competition driving people to compete, they could go to the wall, uh, the company could fail and so on. And the question then becomes, are they going to make the right decisions at the margin in terms of security versus, as it were, taking a bit more of a risk, pushing the envelope uh, to make a greater profit. So this is the kind of uh, situation which I would describe as a collective action problem, the kind of situation that um, needs to be kept in mind when we're thinking about regulation. When we're thinking about regulation, we can't simply think in terms of, this is a bad thing, you shouldn't do it, therefore we're going to have a law against it and lock you up if you do it. Sure, that's part of regulation and lawmaking, but it's not the whole of regulation. And regulation has to be sensitive to some of these collective action problems. Okay, um, that said, um, the other aspect of regulation is, of course, to identify things that shouldn't be taking place, identify, for example, uh, weapon making, weaponization of pathogens. Uh, this is not a good idea if it gets in the, in the hands of, uh, of, of, uh, of terrorists and the like. There should be laws against it. There should be uh, procedures for, for, for punishing people who engage in that and so on and so forth. That's the sort of um, hard regulation that we do need uh, in addition to this other regulation that's more sensitive to collective action problems. Um, and one of the problems here is at the international level is that Although, we, as, as was mentioned, you have things like the, the Violent and Work Weapons Convention, it doesn't have a lot of teeth because it doesn't have the verification procedure. So we just don't know if there's compliance. When it comes to laws and regulations and, uh, and, and enforcement, of course we need the law, of course we need various uh, methods of punishment and, and so on, but we also need devices to determine who is doing what. Uh, we need investigative agencies, uh, and in particular in this instance we need verification. Uh, procedures and of course there are various other uh, kinds of regulations that we want to put in place and have put in place um, to deal with uh, issues to do with safety and biosecurity, uh, licensing of laboratories and so on. One issue that has come up very recently with the ferret flu instance uh, is the issue of partial censorship. Uh, this is the idea that uh, yes I've just discovered how to uh, make enhance the virulence or transmissibility of some dangerous pathogen. Um, perhaps I should have done that, perhaps it's a, it's a good thing in the context ultimately. But then there arises the question as to 
Uh, the secondary question as to whether or not that should be published. And so the idea is that, well, and this is the case in, say, the nuclear industry, it's a good idea to do this to figure out what's going on, uh, to do this work in nuclear science. It's a bad idea uh, to publish all the results, uh, uh, or in particular to publish, as it were, uh, the methods of, uh, uh, to enable people to, to build these weapons or whatever it happens to be. And hence the partial censorship thing, uh, two-tier system that's been uh, that's been promoted, whereby you can publish um, the, the basic uh, experiments that you've done and the results, but you, you leave out that part of the experiment which would allow, allow people to replicate it. So you don't, as it were, you, you tell them about the cake you bake and what, how nice it tastes and so on, but you don't tell them how to make it, is the idea of a two-tier system. So that might be worth thinking about as well uh, this afternoon. Okay, now in the light of uh, time, um, I've got five minutes, is that? Well, if you want to have some discussion, which I think would be... Uh, okay, so be let me just, okay, so let me just um, go finally to some recommendations. We did a, a couple of, myself and the more scientifically literate uh, academic, um, did uh, a couple of projects, one for the Australian government and another one here in, uh, uh, here in the Netherlands, um, and we came up with a number of possible recommendations or at least uh, suggestions that, that one might look at to deal with this kind of problem and related problems, to deal with dual use issues and, and related issues, related biosecurity issues. And so there's a kind of wish list of, of issues that you might want to think about in terms of what you're doing uh, this afternoon. Okay, so one obvious requirement in this area, and people have mentioned this, uh, Andrea and uh, Julia mentioned this earlier, you know, mandatory awareness raising, training and education uh, for, for scientists and, and, and others. Um, a particular institutional mechanism in many countries, in many institutions, universities, they have biosafety committees and it may be that they should be extended uh, to embrace biosecurity issues, which of course may entail uh, looking at the membership of those committees so they've got the necessary expertise. And that would be a particular institutional mechanism to, to try to deal with the problem to some extent. Um, currently, in, in, in many countries, I think still in the US, um, commercial forms are not, are, not, are not required by law to establish biosafety by security committees, or of course, from there, it uh, And it may be that they uh, have for the private sector legislated into, into existence. You could uh, look at the professional associations uh, and strengthen, as it were, the professionalization of scientists. In many, in many different occupational areas, one thinks of lawyers and um, and doctors and so on, they have strong professional associations uh, which you have to be a member of and which require people to have various, to do various things, to do various kinds of education programs, uh, to comply with various codes of conduct um, and that, that complaints can be brought against them and adjudication measures, complaints and discipline procedures are often in place and it can be quite problematic for those uh, <coughs> professional practitioners if they, cut, if they fall foul of their professional association, for example, uh, the most obvious case is the doctor can be struck off and no longer practice as a doctor. But there are, there are other, other kinds of sanctions of a lesser sort that, that could take place. At any rate, the point is that you could look at beefing up uh, professors, professional at the same point holds uh, in the um, You can do various other, introduce various other mechanisms for controlling um, the buying and selling of, of, for example, DNA sequences. You'd establish a clearinghouse, uh, which, had, which, had, which, had, which uh, all orders would need to be reported to and approved by the clearinghouse to make sure that uh, nothing is untoward is happening or that particular people aren't getting their hands on particular um, forms of technology um, or packages or whatnot. And of course, you could uh, finally look at. Uh, People who suggested for a very long time the verification procedures uh, in terms of the knowledge of the toxic and weapons convention. Okay, so. Yeah, 
Well, first of all, thank you for your...